Welcome, everybody, to a, a very special episode of the New Jersey Baseball Show. This week, we talk with Mr. New Jersey College Baseball here, NJIT third base coach, recruiting coordinator, hitting guru, Giuseppe Papaccio, right after a fantastic season for the Highlanders. First ever NCAA tournament bid, first win in the tournament by a New Jersey team since 2011. We've got a pretty neat connection here. We're talking to the zero degrees of separation because Giuseppe was a uh, player on that 2011 Seton Hall team. So we're going to have a great conversation about New Jersey baseball, about NJIT baseball, about building a program, lots of fantastic things. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, some, some great information coming up here for our high school guys uh, getting involved in the, in the recruiting process. So, so first of all, Giuseppe, welcome. Congratulations on an awesome season and, and certainly happy to, uh, to have Mr. New Jersey College Baseball here. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. It's good to see you. I don't, I don't know about the title, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've, you've probably been called worse. You played uh, professionally for a couple of years. That's not a bad thing to have. Definitely. But first of all, just to, to kick off, um, you know, your career, Seton Hall, player, you know, all Big East, senior year, NJ, uh, CBA, player of the year as your, as a, or your final year. I'm hitting uh, 365, a number of Seton Hall records that still hold up. Um, NCAA tournament appearance, uh, winning a game in the NCAA tournament. How does this, you know, this whole experience building a team into a, a conference champ, building a team into breaking kind of a 10 year state slide in the, in the tourney, um, your experiences in Fayetteville as a whole, just how awesome the weekend was. How does this compare to that, to your time in pro ball? And like I said, we as high as double A in the Cubs organization, but you know, what you did this weekend or a couple weekends ago, how does that compare? Yeah, we actually had this conversation um, in practice right after the conference tournament. So we were practicing to go to a regional and I did a little stat crunch um, in my office and I looked at the comparison between the 2011 team and this America East team this year. So in 2011 was my sophomore year in college and in 2010, our team didn't make the Big East tournament. And then 2011, we were picked to finish 11th out of 12 teams. And this America East team, NJIT, was picked this year six out of eight. So that just that start was kind of similar. And then it was the same way with, with my Seton Hall team. We didn't start great during the year, but then we got into the tournament. We got really hot in the tournament. And then we won the Big East championship and went to a regional. So I the thing, my, my message to the guys in that practice this year, I gave them the whole spiel of, okay, we were picked 11th out of 12th. It was like Louisville, Notre Dame, USF, Pitt, all the, all these big time Big East schools ahead of us, UConn. Um, and we were picked 11th out of 12th and we, we just never laid down. We were a tough team and we got into the tournament and beat we talked about beating like a UConn team who hosted a regional. They had like 10 draft picks on their team. The Big East that year had two first round picks, Matt Barnes and George Springer. Um, and we actually had to beat them twice. We beat them twice in the tournament um, in a late inning game. And then we 10 run ruled them the next day. So my message to the team this year was like, I've been here before. We were, we were counted out and we were down. Um, but the magic really doesn't run out. That was my quote to the guys. Like the, the magic doesn't run out. We, we, we got really high, got into the America East tour tournament, took the automatic qualifier, but practice going into the NCAA tournament, I was like, it's not, we're not just done. Like, okay, this was a great year. I was like, there's yeah. still some magic left. Like I've seen you guys do, the amount of late inning heroics that I've seen from this team is, is really unbelievable. There are times I, we'd hit like a game time home run in the eighth and I'm, I high five the guy coming around third and then I'm like scratching my head. I'm like, is this real? Like how many times, can this happen? It, it was just a magical season for the guys. So it was really similar to my playing experience in 2011. Yeah, no, it was fa fascinating. And, and to see that the way the season progressed, right, from a, a three and 12 start, I believe it, it was, um, to, to where it ended up, you know, as, as far as your coaching career, I got to imagine that's the most rewarding thing is the way everybody bought in and, and kept after it and, you know, yeah. turned the season around and, and made history. Yeah, that was the thing. We we met as a staff, I think, twice, and we kind of sat down and we were like, what do we need to do? Because we were a little banged up as far as like our, our shortstop and our right fielder being injured and out. Um, but also, I felt like 
I was like, I'm giving the guys everything I have from like a practice and preparation standpoint. And I felt like the guys were giving us everything that they had. And it just wasn't equaling to win. So we were trying to like audit everything. We're like, what, are, what, what else can we do? What's diff-? Because the effort with our guys, I'm sure you've seen some of, the, some of the games, the effort with our guys was never, ever a question. Like right. everybody, everybody showed up every single day put their nose down, got to work, and the, and the coaching staff did the same thing. So it was, when we started 3-12, and 12, we were sitting there scratching our head because the, in the fall and in the winter, we were kind of like, this is going to be a good team. Like, we have a lot of really experienced players in the, in the pitching staff, and half of, more than half of our uh, defensive guys were, were returners, so our whole lineup was returners. We were like, we're going to be good. And then some guys got banged up, but but also some guys underperformed a little bit, but the effort was always there. So we, we had that meeting and we were like, what do we need to do? And we, we tried to, we tried to change up a little bit of like practice planning and do a couple different things. But I think it was just a matter of time. It was really a matter of like time, health, um, a little bit of grit, as you know. And I think we just like, we kind of stuck with it. It was like, nobody ever quit. Jersey grit overcomes a lot, doesn't it? Yep. It certainly does. That's the sixth tool. You need That's that. right. Absolutely. I think it's the first tool, personally. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The other ones slide down to two through six. <laughs> you're right. You're right. And uh, so, so again, you know, your background, Nutley High School, right? So, so North Jersey, you know, full out, um, you know, Seton Hall. You know, you've got the full Jersey experience, you know, coming, you know, growing up. Um, NJIT baseball, obviously, now at a, at a high. You know, anybody who watched the games um, can see. You know, it takes about four seconds to notice the the culture, the you know the the togetherness the team had. I mean, li- literally, right? The first batter of the Arkansas game hits a home run, Albert Choi. You know, I mean, talk about crazy, right? So, um, you know, that plus the school that you know you're selling one of the great schools in the Northeast. Um, you know, everybody kind of in the media made a a big thing about, hey, this is the team without the home field. Right. This is, you know, hey, our home field is Baum Walker, too. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, which is a cute story. I mean, I, I got to admit, I, I kind of fall victim to that, too. I mean, stories sell, yeah. but I can't imagine it's the best thing for recruiting. Right. Um, as recruiting coordinator, what's you know, how do we take this year? There's so many positives to sell about the program. You know, what's your message now? You know, someone who's lived the New Jersey experience as a player and seen it as a coach. You know, how do we go from, you know, this was a great story to how do we springboard this to the to to make it more than just a one year thing? Yeah, I think I think it comes from belief, and that was a lot of the exit meetings that we had at the end of the year with a lot of the seniors and the upperclassmen was, okay, there, the grit and the hard work was always there. Like the effort was never a question with this team. So this was the the end of my third year. It was really never a question any year that I was here. I think just kind of like the belief um, that you can win, and the belief that we can be a good team is the thing that like springboarded us. I think that we expected to be a good team early on in the year, but then you start you start winning games and you start playing well and late inning heroics are exciting and the, the dugout is exciting. and There are a bunch of like really good players, the, the rookie of the year in the conference, a couple first teamers, guys are having good years. So now, I think guys are believing it a little bit more because guys guys wanted it before, but there's a difference between wanting it and believing it. So once they saw a little bit of success, I think they believe in it. So now I think the guys will come back on campus because a lot of them said it when they were leaving campus for summer ball. They're like, we have to come back here and be the same exact team, just a little bit better, like same exact energy, same exact grit, just a little bit more refined in certain areas. And now the the underlying thing is the belief they know in their heart that they can win and they can win on a, on a conference stage and on a national stage too. So I think that's, I think the springboard is in the, the, the player's heart and their mind and the, in the belief in the program. Yeah, I got to think that regional, you know, three games is worth about a thousand games as far as that's concerned. I agree. <laughs> you know, Hey, we, Arkansas, Arkansas had to go to Kevin Cox just to hold us down. You know, yeah. it's, it's crazy, right? It's, it it's just, it, it, it was, it was surprising in the moment. Because you look at the scoreboard and like we scored one, I think, in the first three. And it's it is surprising because of okay, you play the, the team that was the number one team in the country for three months before that, and they they're all everything, the national player of the year, one of the best offenses. But it's also for the for the stage that we were in the season, it's not surprising. Like if you saw the conference tournament, 
like we're we're down and then we come back and we win. We're down, we come back and then we win. It was like mm-hmm. we had so many magical moments that I was surprised in the moment, but then I look back and I'm like, of course these guys would do this. Like of course yeah. they would go first first batter of the game hit the homer and slide the crowd. So <laughs> it was kind of typical of the of the way that we were going. And we and we know there are no moral victories in D1 college baseball. We know that. But, you know, for those three innings, that attention that NJIT baseball got, not just in North Jersey, but across the country, you know, you keep flashing that score, NJIT three, Arkansas nothing. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I got to imagine that that's, that hour, hour, 15 minutes, whatever, did – as much for NJIT baseball from a perception wise as anything ever. Yeah. I mean, just the amount of people that I know mutually or that I like knew when I was younger that reached out to me was mind blowing. But then like, that's such a small sample size for the amount of people that were watching and saw it. Like, I I don't know how you can quantify how many people saw it, but it was just, it was great to do that early on in the game. I think if we, if it happened a little later in the game, maybe not as many people are watching, but like they, they turn on the game right away and it's, it's a quick score and, and we look pretty good right away. So I think it got some people's attention. And then I think that that hot start kind of carried our momentum through the weekend and, and yeah. we come out on top and we only won one game at the regional. But I think that grab, like that was the immediate grab of attention. And then people were like, these guys are pretty tough. Like they're a pretty talented team that have a lot of, have a lot of tough players so that I think that was the exciting part to watch is that it happened right away and then it was like we got to watch these guys you never know so so that weekend obviously fantastic once it ends you really kind of kick it into your job as recruiting coordinator for the summer so my first question would be after like a 20-month dead period due to COVID you're finally allowed out of the house so to speak get on the road travel see guys that you've been you know zooming basically for the last year and a half how does it feel to first of all how did you recruit during the covid the dead period how does it feel to be out of the house you know and and seeing baseball games um and what are you what do you look for as a as a d1 recruiting coordinator that we can you know help inform um our our you know younger guys watching this parents of younger guys watching this you know how's the process work yeah so First to start the the COVID recruiting process was it was kind of grueling just as far as being able to trust yourself and trust your eyes because when you're at a game and you can see people move and you see them play catch down the line you see them do their sprints then they take infield outfield then you see every pitch of their at bat for four at bats and you see the way they act in the dugout you get a feel and there's like a certain aura around each player that you're recruiting and you kind of have like a gut instinct you've been around the game long enough that you have a gut in, gut instinct about the guy that you like or you don't like. Now, the, the video thing was tough because, and I started doing it probably a couple months into COVID recruiting, was everybody was just sending highlights, one swing highlights, a double, a double, a homer, a homer. And I was like, am I getting tricked into thinking these guys are like good? So I, the guys that I was recruiting, like that, that I was actually on the phone with, not just getting emails because emails, and I don't blame anybody that I would do the same thing as a player to get recruited. Like the emails were insane. And I'm sure that's the same for everybody across the board. The amount of emails every day, it was like, I can almost like answer them like text messages. They were coming in like that quick because players were like, what do I do in the summer? So what I was saying about the, the highlight reel is like, I felt like after a while, I was like, okay, I need to start talking to the players that I like and I need to see their full at bat. I, I, I would say like, Hey, can you get like your dad or somebody to send me a video unedited of your whole at bat? Because like, for me, I want to see this. Does he see the breaking ball? Does he chase breaking ball? Is the guy on the mound throwing at, at least decently hard? Like, or, or is it someone that's not really a, a division one or even a college baseball pitcher just making him look good? Right. Um, there were a couple of things I had to like audit my routine of, of COVID recruiting. Oh, sorry. I had, to my, I had to audit my routine of COVID recruiting because I was like, okay, I click my email, it's a highlight video. Open the email, highlight video. So I was like, all right, I, I got to try and do this a little bit better. So I, I guess that was the thing is I just made, I tried to make an effort to do a little bit more with the actual game-like video instead of just highlights. But the other, this is kind of a long-winded answer, but the other thing you had to do that was a little bit more time-consuming was was background check and call some guys, like call some coaches that you know that are mutual friends, 
maybe that aren't even his coach, but hey, he lives in the area. Did you play him last year? How is he? Or his travel coach or his high school coach? And you just, there was more time to do background checking than there usually is. Usually you're at games watching. You can't call everybody on every player. So there was a little bit more time to call and do some do some background checking on the guys that you like. Um, now the next thing with just actually getting out and recruiting too is is way better. Um, the so for us we got back on Monday. Um, I think it was the sixth or seventh, and then like the next day, the the eighth was my thirtieth birthday, but also the first day of the recruiting contact period. First day you can recruit in over maybe like a year and a half. A year and a half. Yeah. We get off the plane and we go right to recruiting. Like <laughs> we went out, we had some we we had some guys on campus in the morning, um, and then we we went out and saw some games, and it was like the season never. I, I still I'm telling you we've been rec- we've been on the road, and not to not to make us seem like we're working harder than anybody else, but my suitcase from the regional is still sitting in there half unpacked. Because like every day, because I'm also I'm also expecting my son in about a month, so I'm trying. Congratulations! To, thank you. First, first one. Yeah, my Excellent. wife and I are. Carly is so excited; it's great. But I'm trying to get ahead of it as as do as much recruiting visits left, and going out. By the way, lefty pitcher or left-handed hitting catcher? What are you going for? I think a left-handed hitting shortstop that can He's run and hit for power. <laughs> See, that's that's the message. D1 recruiting coordinator. Left-handed hitting shortstop. So parents out there, that's that's what we're going for. That's that's the order <laughs> I put in. We'll see what I got. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, like, we've been nonstop since we got back to campus. Um, partially because of me, I, I want to get as much done before I have another person to be sure. responsible for. Sure. But also, like, that's kind of the way it is right now. There's a lot going on, and if you're if you're staying home and not really doing anything, I think they're you're you're losing out on players and losing out on the experience of kind of. Even if it's just right now, seeing as many people and making as many connections as you can, new connections, since we haven't been out, I think I think it's beneficial for us. The, the staff is doing a good job getting out and, and seeing people and, and having guys on campus. So it's great. I mean, just to, like yesterday, I was at a game that I told you about, and just to like shake hands with people and talk about players in person and, hey, watch him. Watch him right now. Watch him warm up. Watch his breaking ball. Or watch him, watch him take in and out and watch the way he does this. Like, being there and seeing it and kind of like feeling the, the presence of like the players and the atmosphere of the game is so different. Like, and I think it's something you take for granted when it's before it's taken away from you, like COVID, like recruiting in person, you get, I think you can trust your gut better. Like I feel better about the guys that I like because I'm like, all right, I saw him last night. He could play for us instead of like, he looks good in that video, but I don't know who was pitching. Like, I don't know if it was someone sure underhanding or what so there's a there's a much better context when you're there obviously 100 percent. yeah okay so from your perspective then you know there are what what is your pitch sounds like a sales pitch but you know you yeah to them you know about to to sell njit because until this year you're you're dealing with a program that you can't just say Hey, look what we did. Here's our banners. You know what? There are a lot of great things to sell, but what? What are? Who are you looking for, and what sells to them? I think the the first thing that I think is important for guys that are looking to get recruited, like high school players. I think a lot of programs are similar to us, where we don't take a lot, a ton of guys who have like late projectability, and they could be good. They might be a project. Like we we maybe take like one of those or two of those a year. We Right now, we recruit guys who we feel like can come in and play as a freshman, guys who are kind of physical, guys who are quick, guys who, they, especially for me, just being uh, a hitting guy, like guys who look like they can hit already. Because hitting at the college level is hard to teach from the ground up. Like, it's hard to take a kid, okay, he's a good defender, he cannot swing it at all. It's hard to take those kids because it's it's hard to, to do that when you have 18 hitters and it's hard to just make somebody into a hitter. Now, do we, do we put a ton of time into development? Yes. Do we put a ton of time into data and video? Of course. And we, we do a bunch with just relationship building with the players too, but there's a certain aspect where I think players right now, and you've definitely heard this before players right now are a little bit more worried about like getting the sweatshirt and the logo or the, or the ranking instead of being really good. And like if, and this, uh, I'm sure I'm echoing a million different people. When you're good, people know. So I think it, it's 
it comes with like the stuff in the weight room, the stuff with conditioning, the stuff in the cages, the stuff with leadership, character, like all that stuff adds up to being a good player. So I think that's always at the priority, at the top of the priority list for high school players. And, and that's the type of guys that we recruit. That's the reason I'm telling you that is like, I'm sure a lot of colleges fall into the same, same category of what they're looking for. But for us, we're looking for somebody who is not, and, and it was different. My, for my first, my first year here, I felt like I needed to just find the best athlete who can run and who might have power. Now there's a mixture of like, does he look a little developed in his body? Can I tell he's in the weight room? Can I tell he has body control? Is he athletic? Can he hit a little bit? Like, can he see the breaking ball? Like, can he catch up to velocity? I want to see him face somebody that's respectable on the mound. And I think when I was younger, um, and I, not, it's not like it was years ago, it was a couple of years ago, but it was more like send me your highlights and like, I'll make a call on that. Like if you're athletic, you're quick and you have a, a pretty swing, like I'll take you. And I think that was, we, we didn't do that with a lot of guys, but that was in my head. I was like, I, I felt like I could make the call based on athleticism. And right now I'm not in that same mindset anymore. I think that's just the, that's just the growth of, of recruiting and coaching is that now I do a little bit more in depth looking at like who they're facing, what they're doing, like all the stuff that I just said, seeing a breaking ball and then talking to coaches. I, I think I spend more time on it now. I spend more time on the little things. Um, and I think that's important for players to know too, is that it's not just your PBR ranking. It's not, it's not your 15 second video. That's not the make or break for your career. I think it's, when we call guys like you and when we call travel high school coaches and when we call their trainer, we ask a lot of questions. It's not just like, Hey, what was their 60? I think it's like, can you do that? Like when he goes to the cage, does he bring anybody with him? Is he a leader? Like does he, when it's a big spot in the game, is he, is he at the end of the dugout or is he on the fence? Like, is he looking to, to get in that bat or is he like, I hope my name doesn't get called here. Yeah. Sure. There's, there's a lot that goes into it. That's a long-winded answer, but I think that's important for players to know, like being a, a good, legitimate person, character, and baseball player all wrapped in one, they're all really, really important. Like that's, I think that's something that we've done a good job recruiting. We pull guys onto campus and there are times we walk guys around campus and we make a read on, okay, we wanted to offer this guy a scholarship, but we have to make, he, he has to pass the test of like hanging out with us. Can he fit on our team? Because I think from the guys that you probably talk to you and from what you've seen on TV, like our culture is near and dear to our, our heart. Like it's really important to us. So we don't want to bring in just really good athletes who might not be a great guy or might not be a really hard worker. Like we're, we're looking to check all those boxes. Like he's a really good person, really good leader, loves the weight room, academically really strong and really serious about that, respectful all of those things. I'm sure everybody, a lot of people will tell you something similar, but that's, that's important to us because I think that's what makes us tick. That's what we were saying before. What were you going to say? I say, and I think in the Northeast, you know, there are, there are some great high school players in New Jersey, but realistically is Jack Leiter isn't going to New, a, New, a New Jersey school, uh, you know, at this point, unless you hit the lottery, right? I mean, it, Chase Petty's not going to New Jersey school. Uh, Anthony Solomito's not going to New Jersey school. You're not going to get the guy throwing 98 out of a New Jersey high school, right? I mean, it, and and that's not you. It's kind of Northeast. You know, you're going to go play in the SEC if that happens. So you need those other factors too, I'm sure. And not just you, but Ryder, Monmouth, you know, you know Princeton. I mean, uh, FDU, all those schools are looking for the, the X factor, I'm sure. Yeah, of course. And the, the thing that's so important to us that I said is, is culture is like this year is, is a prime example. Like we started out three and 12, but the guys are, are tough. They're gritty. They're, they're hard workers. They love each other. I think that's at the top of the list. Like I, I haven't seen many teams genuinely love every guy on the team and just like to be around them as much as this team. So that, that's always really important to us. Like we, we might like a player. It's only happened like once or twice to us on a visit. We love the player, but it's like he won't fit in. He, and it's not its not really his fault, but we do have a certain type of player and person that we recruit, and it's important to us. And academics, you know, again, obviously NJIT, there's going to be a standard there. But just across D1 in general, as a recruiting coordinator, how important are, is the grade – portion of the whole thing because you know because of 11.7 you know it's just you can't just throw 100 percent academic athletic scholarship at people and cover it yeah you're 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 spot on for us academics is is like 
So I, I break it up into thirds. So it's baseball, it's academics, and it's the person and the worker. So they're like, they're all equally as important. So when we go and watch a game or when we talk to a coach, I, they send me video, but the first thing I say are how are his grades? And a lot of coaches know how high of an academic institution NJIT is. So they, right. they don't really sell me like guys who are not like, going to be a, a contender right. for to get in. Um, but that is one of the first things we ask because it's, it does shrink the, the pool of recruiting a little bit, but it also makes it easier for the other coaches to understand what type of school we are. So for the future, they know, okay, I can't sell him just anybody. So for us, academics is huge because also, like you said, from a scholarship perspective, like you want to make it as cheap as you can for families. So the guys that you recruit, you would love to give them 40% baseball money and then they get 10 extra thousand dollars of academic money. Then you make it really cheap. And as a, a state school, we're pretty cheap to go to in-state anyway. And even out of state, it's pretty affordable too. So we do, we like to recruit high-level students, obviously, because we're a top 100 institution. We're a top 100 university. So that's what we, that's kind of the standard. We can't mm-hmm. really just get anybody in. Um, but it's also like, we want to make it cheap for guys. And that's how we make it really appealing. They yeah. come to a great school for for kind of cheap and they play top-level baseball on a, on an NCAA tournament team for, for cheap. So that's that's kind of our thing is we got to get guys with good grades. Now the field situation, you you play at Kane, right? I mean, you that's where you do everything, practice games. You know, it may not be perfect, but it still is a pretty good. There are programs probably in worse shape. You know, you're not talking about far from campus, right? You're talking about kind of your own little, you know, oasis, and you're not drawing ten thousand fans a game anyway. You're you know you're. It's, it's not really a hard field to get to. So, I mean, it's, even that isn't as big of a negative as maybe we made it seem. No, it's, it's not a negative at all. And I give, the, I give our players a ton of credit because I never hear them ever complain. We, get, we go out of the locker room and get on the bus. And guys, I tell them they put two or three songs on their, I, on their iPhone and we're there. And there, yeah. It's like 15 minutes. They don't even need to – half of them probably don't even look up and we're there. So the other thing <laughs> is like – would I love to walk right out onto our field? Yes. But when we get there after the short bus ride, 15 minutes, it's a beautiful turf field with yep. scoreboard and lights and great netting system. And everything there is very, very clean and orderly. Like that's when we get there, that's our field. And we'll, with, with the recruiting part of it is like, I, we, we pitch it the same way. It's like, there are some places you, from, from your locker room to the field, you got to walk 10 minutes anyway. So for us, it's like, you just, you get in the bus and it's you're getting your mind right, but also the guys get off the bus and it feels like a game day. It feels like they they pop their headphones on and they get their they listen to music, they get off the bus and it's it's business when we show up there. So it's also I think it's a strength. And anybody that's been there knows that that complex, that facility holds up with any really in the conference. Uh-huh. You know, it just doesn't happen to be in your backyard. It's just it's just a small little bus ride away. It's yeah, not hundred percent. Yeah. Again, I, I can't give the players enough credit. Like, they're, we've never, ever had to, like, hey, guys, I know this is a grunt. It's never like that. And the other thing, too, is, like, when we show up to practice, we never have to pump anybody up. Like, the guys get off the bus. The guys get off the bus, and they put their spikes on, and they're, like, yeah, want to get going. So, it's right. exciting because in the, in the fall, sometimes the practices can get, if it's the same time every day for 30 days or 40 days, and it's t- structured a little bit the same way. Sometimes it gets meticulous, and I, I've been there where you have to like, all right, what can we do today to make this not the same as yesterday? Even, even not as far as like what we're doing in practice planning, but when we go to Keene, like every day, it's like we're getting on the bus for a game. We're getting on the bus for a game. We're getting on the bus for a game. And it's nice as a coaching staff. You never have to beg for energy or beg for effort from anybody. They, the guys are, I'm telling you, they're, they're awesome. So, so we jokingly threw around the Mr. New Jersey college baseball title. Um, but to, to focus a little bit on that, and it's not you necessarily, but to focus on the, the issue here in a sec, uh, for, for a few seconds, you know, it's hard to believe, given Rutgers, given Seton Hall, given Ryder, given their histories, that it's been, you know, 10 years between NCAA tournament wins, five, you know, I, I said those schools. Princeton's got as much college baseball history as any school in, in the country, going That's back to the hard. 18th. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's been five years since the since Princeton, since New Jersey even had a team in the tournament. You know, when when Princeton won the Ivy League. When you think about 
how great a state it is for high school baseball, how kind of densely populated so many prospects are there. What, what do we do? How do we make sure that, that more of New Jersey, you know, stays in New Jersey and that we don't have this gap again, right? That's got to be a, if you can master that challenge, you're probably writing a book and coaching anywhere you want, but, but, but what do we, you know, how do we, how do we do that? Right. What, it, what is, what do we have to do for New Jersey college baseball to, to get back to where it was 20 years ago? I do think that the, the, the time that we're in where everything is online changes the way that you recruit a little bit. So a lot of New Jersey guys that wouldn't be getting seen by Florida and Tennessee Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, they would like Tennessee and Florida might not know about a couple of the kids in Jersey. And those guys end up going to NJIT or Rutgers or Seton Hall. Now it's like, if you have a video, you can send it across the world in two seconds. So I think it's easier for the good in-state players to go out of state and Hey, if you can play in, in, in the SEC and it's 90 degrees every day, like I could see that. But I think when you look at the rosters of some of the older older teams, like in state, I think more of them are some of the best players in the state, maybe because they, they, didn't, they didn't have ties across the country to the, to the Midwest or the West Coast or in Florida and Tennessee and the Carolinas. Like I think it, it was just like, all right, guys were coaches like myself, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, they – they went to a lot of high school and Legion games. And mm-hmm. now it's like you go to national tournaments and then you see video and your, your roster is way different. I think even, I, I think for us, even um, last year, or the year before we, we might've had like nine States represented on our roster and probably 10 years ago, NJIT, I'd be shocked if you had five. So it's, I think it's just the, the day and age we're in, you can get seen anywhere pretty much. And if you're good, a lot of the a lot of the southern schools or west coast schools will pluck you. So I think that's I don't know how I don't know how to keep the guys here though. I don't, no, I don't but know. I thought it was really encouraging to to not just see NJIT have success with a, a lot of Jersey in there on their roster. Certainly, Ryder had a very strong New Jersey contingent. Um, Monmouth, who you know obviously got who could have been what Ryder was, has a, a huge New Jersey you know contingent of, of star players. So I, I think it's. You know, I think it's there. I think it's hopefully getting back in that direction. Um, you know, Rutgers certainly is going to is is picked up a lot over the last few years with uh, with Coach Owens. Um, let's hope, right? Yeah. I, I one thing too that I that I think helps us um, keep New Jersey players at home for us at least is that we're in we're in a, a smaller Northeast bubble now that people know what NJIT is based on what we did in, in the postseason. So now the local players and the local coaches, I'll be completely honest with you. Sometimes they, when I would call coaches, they're not giving us, Hey, I got a guy for you. They're not giving us the same guy that they sell Rutgers and Seton Hall and Princeton. They were giving us like the, the one a or one B guy. Now it's like, okay, they're a tournament team and they're, they're this and they're that. It's like, now we're in the same conversation. Yeah. So I think that helps us. And I think the players, like we've had guys on campus the last couple of days, every single one of them. Oh man, I saw ESPN three. I saw your Twitter. Mm-hmm. I saw, everybody saw it. So it's, it's helping us. And it, to be completely honest, I'm, I'm doing a little bit more recruiting in, in our area because people know what NJIT is now. So I think the way that we're talking, keeping some local players home, I think that'll help us. You can't beat the awesomeness and the story and the the visual that was was shown by, and we got to give Miles Rudnick a ton of credit for that too. I mean, he was uh, Miles was great. I've been at every almost every recruit that we've had on campus. I walk him by the desk, and I'm like, "That's your guy." I was like, "That's the guy that helped us do this." He's he's an A plus. He's 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 A plus plus. He's awesome. Great person and really good at his job too. Absolutely. So so. Your career, right, as far as coaching is concerned, how has NJIT been that great step for you? Because it's not just, okay, I mean, again, not to minimize, but the hitting coach, you get the recruiting coordinator on top of that. You're actually calling the offensive game now, obviously working with with Coach uh, McClellan, you know, coaching third base for him. Um, where do you feel, I mean, how how – Happy are you to be at NJIT right now and be at this point? And, you know, how's it been for you as a coach? Yeah, it's been great. And I'm, I'm super happy to be here. I've always been happy to be here because the guys are so enjoyable. The guys on the team are such good people and they're such hard workers. They love each other. But for me as a coach, too, I've developed a lot because when I got this job, Robbie, is, he was a former pitcher and he was a pitching coach. So it was like the offense is yours. And that's kind of the responsibility that I wanted. I, I wanted mm-hmm. to see 
to kind of prove to myself and to prove to, I guess, just the teams in the conference that like, okay, we can do this. Like we can have one of the top offenses in the conference and we can do this as a whole. And it's not, we, we have one really good guy and the rest of the guys, it's, it's kind of, for me, it's been, okay, we have to coach every guy on the offense and on the team. We have to coach every guy the same because you never know who you're going to need. And that happened a bunch of times this year. It was like, okay, we have to put him here because he's hurt. And you're like, in my head, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I never overlooked that kid in the fall. And I'm glad I never skipped out on any, any cage work with him. I'm glad we used every guy. So at, for me, as, from a development um, standpoint as a coach, it's been, it's been everything I can dream of and more because I've had, I had a lot of responsibility on the hitting end, the offensive end, just defensively and recruiting wise too. It's like, I, I kind of structure where we need to go, who we need to see, who we need to get on campus, how much scholarship, I kind of structure all that. So this is the end of my third full year. So doing that for a couple of years, I feel like I, I've, I've kind of, um, made some leaps and bounds because like I told you in the beginning, it was like, I, I want the best athlete and I want this and I want that. Mm-hmm. And now it's with a little bit more um, responsibility every single year. I feel like I've, I've, uh, I've grown a little bit in every aspect, hitting defense and, and being the recruiting coordinator too. And that's, that's a testament too to, to Robbie. Robbie gives me complete free reign on almost anything. And that that's not the same for a lot of head coaches. A lot of head coaches are like, you're going to do this and this is how it's going to be. So I, I'm, I'm really yeah. thankful for that. I've, I have a lot of freedom with my job. When you get an environment like that, it's special. You know, it's, it's There's just, a lot of room for growth. There's a Before, lot of room for growth when you can be your own person. Yeah. Before we go today, just a, a thank you to our sponsor, the Edward Lesky Company, edwardlesky.com, uh, general contractors union shop out of uh, Union, New Jersey, 908-686-7272. So up in your, your part of the, uh, the world up there, but a, a great backer of NJ College Baseball. Um, Frank Del Gercio, his, his son, Frank, is a pitcher on rider and a huge supporter of, uh, of college baseball. So Edward Lesky Company, work safe, work smart, work tomorrow. Giuseppe, amazing season. Let's hope that this is, again, this is not a one-hit wonder. This is hopefully the springboard of, you know, building something that, you know, again, it, to, to have another kind of uh, highlighted program in New Jersey at the D1 level, that's that's awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. And thanks for all the kind words. So you've, you've done a lot for us, too. And I completely agree. The guys, when we left in the exit meetings, the guys were excited. They're they're going to summer ball, but they're they're coming back with some belief in their heart and their yeah. mind. So it should be should be a good year ahead. Absolutely, can't wait to get up there. Hopefully in the fall to uh, to catch some fall ball, and if not, certainly a lot in the, in the in the spring next year. So yeah, we'd love to have you. Thanks again, Giuseppe, and uh, and get out in the road and bring some uh, get some get some new Highlanders. Yeah, some local guys. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.